Wonderful. Okay, well, we are at the top of the hour and I know we still have a bunch of people who are uh, joining us right now. So welcome everybody. I'm James Nelson, Principal and Head of Tri-State Investment Sales and um, really appreciate you joining us today for the market 2021 outlook and just so much going on out there. And so uh, could not be happier that we have Mark Zandi with us, who's the Chief Economist from Moody's Analytics. and uh, Mark uh, and Moody's are, are leading providers of economic research, data, and analytical tools. Mark also co-founded economy.com, which Moody's purchased in 2005. So um, maybe, Matt, we can put the link uh, for people to um, sign up for the newsletter there, but some really great information there and, and a great uh, tool. And, and I know, for one, you've got a breakdown of the latest stimulus proposal uh, which I know we'll be getting into shortly. Uh, Mark is also on the board and the directors of MGIC, the nation's largest private mortgage insurance company. And you're a trusted advisor to policymakers and an influential source of economic analysis for business, journalists, and the public. Uh, you frequently testify before Congress and have had regular briefings on the economy for corporate brands, trade associations, and policymakers at all levels. And you're often quoted by the news outlets and I guess on CNBC, NPR, Meet the Press, CNN, and now um, Real Estate Investing Live from New York and, and the, uh, the Nelson Report. So <laughs> welcome. And um, just uh, again, I think in the, this, this time of um, crisis to have a, um, you know, su such a um, logical voice uh, in analyzing what's taking place out there and how we move forward is uh, very much appreciated. So thank you again for joining us. Thanks, James. I, I want to thank you. I apologize for the, the dog, if you hear the dog, uh, a little older and a little senile and there's just nothing we can do about it. So oh, no, no, yeah. no worries. No, yeah. no worries at all. Um, so why don't we start by Kind of putting this all in context before we we jump into the present, uh, coming off the, the heels of, of COVID, the global shutdown, uh, truly unprecedented times. Uh, ha have you ever seen anything like this in the past? Uh, can you correlate this to any crisis? And if so, what could we learn from it? Uh, no, this is uh, stands on its own. It's like off the rails. Uh, I, I mean, you know, to some degree, it's. Uh, like a natural disaster, you know, but obviously that in, it's uh, hit the entire global economy. Uh, but the same kind of dynamics, economic dynamics, you know, a hurricane comes in to Florida, has this supply side shock, it knocks uh, businesses out, uh, and then they uh, get back up and running, and money su support comes in from the federal government, insurance companies, and you get this burst of activity. and you know, over time you recover what you lost. But of course, that's a very small geography, very short period of time. And the obvious big difference is with a hurricane, you, you kind of, you know when it's going to end. Uh, and in, in, in the case of the pandemic, at least early on, there was no visibility and it was, you know, obviously very scary. So yeah, no, I, hard to draw any corollary. What corollaries here? One interesting thing is though, you know, we did have the 1918 Spanish flu. And so that you know, it was a pretty good case study and don't have a whole lot of data. But the one thing that I find amazing from an academic perspective is sort of everything we are doing now, we kind of did then, you know, the social distancing, the mask wearing, we've kind of figured out that you needed to be outside, don't be indoors. I mean, there's pictures of school kids in Boston in the middle of winter being educated outside because people figured that out. Uh, people got tired of of the social distancing and the self quarantine and the closed businesses. And, you know, they started going out again and that's why we had second and third waves. So there was actually a pretty good case study there, but, you know, not a lot of economic data uh, to fall back on. And of course we had world war one at the same time. So it made it a little more difficult to interpret. Mm -hmm. It's great context. And I, I know in New York, a lot of the conversation that we have, um, you know, talks about how we came back after nine 11, um, you know, and, and when people say, well, will, you know, will we see a return to the workplace? Will we see a return to the cities? And, you know, after 9-11, there was people who said, 
companies will never want to work in office buildings above the fourth floor. And, and it seemed almost within a year or two things had snapped back. So, you know, we talk about do people have short memories? You know, once there's a vaccine, once everyone's back, um, we, we'll kind of go back to life uh, as normal. But um, certainly we, we, we've had hardship in the, the past and, and we've figured out how to, to come back. But to your point, that these, these are truly unprecedented times. So yeah, I think this one will be different than 9-11, though. I mean, uh, you know, I, I suspect that, uh, you know, the work from anywhere uh, phenomena is, is a fundamental shift. Uh, in, not that there won't be some pendulum swinging back here, but just to give you a, a statistic, I mean, uh, prior to the pandemic, and this is data from the Bureau of Labor Statistics, less than 10% of the workforce work consistently from their home. In the teeth of the pandemic, April, it was 35%. Obviously, I'm rounding. It, we're now back down to 20, 25%. Uh, I think that's mm -hmm. where we're going to settle. And then over time, it's going to start rising again. So, you know, I do think we will see work from anywhere uh, be a long running structural change as a result of the pandemic that has all kinds of implications, obviously. So uh, this feels more real to me. And in the case of 9-11, I, I suppose that actually would have been more fundamental, more structural if there was another terrorist attack, right? Uh, we only had that one, really. And so people kind of faded away from consciousness and concern. But if you had another one or two or three of them, that might have been more fundamental as well. Very true, very true. So I uh, would love now to jump into the, the current uh, day and age and the stimulus is on the top of everyone's mind. And I uh, was on a call yesterday with Congressman Gregory Meeks um, said, although the, the house had proposed the 2.2 trillion, I guess at one point, President Trump had talked about 1.8 billion. Sounds like what we're looking at right now is 900 billion, um, which he did say was really for the next four month period. Um, based on what I, I saw in your report on economy.com, you said this still might not be enough. So maybe talk a little bit about the stimulus that is being contemplated now. When do you think this is going to happen and, and what's going to be the impact on the economy? Well, uh, let me say I've, I've been wrong about this. I mean, I had expected that lawmakers would get it together before the election and pass another risk rescue package. Uh, it may you know, good economic sense, and I thought good political sense, but, you know, who am I? I'm an economist, who knows, you know, how these guys are thinking. Uh, so I, you know, I think it's very difficult to handicap, but, you know, I do explicit forecasts, I have to make explicit assumptions, and right now I'm assuming we're going to get a 900, roughly a $900 billion package, fiscal relief package, signed into law, you know, before the end of the month in the lame duck session. So it gets out into the economy, uh, by January. And that's important because the remaining fiscal support to the economy that, that had been provided by previous legislation, the most notable being the CARES Act back in March, that's the two point, almost the $2.2 trillion in support. That's been fading away and is all gone at the end of uh, December. I mean, the supplemental unemployment insurance, that's all gone. Uh, there's some tax credits for businesses to retain employees, that's all gone. Uh, there's a rental eviction moratoria that was put into place by President Trump under executive order. That expires uh, at the end of January. Student loan pay, uh, borrowers have had a moratoria on payments. That deadline was just extended to the end of February. But, you know, uh, I'm assuming we're going to get this rescue package in place in the nick of time to kind of fill the hole that is going to be created by the expiration of the remaining additional support. If that's the case, then that'll be that'll be enough. You know, I think we'll have a month or two or three of job loss. Maybe unemployment will tick higher, but you know, we're, this period will it'll, it'll be a pause. It won't be a double dip recession. You know, we'll continue continue to move forward. I think unemployment rate uh, with six point seven percent nationwide today will stay between six and a half and seven percent for much of 2021 and won't really be until the end of the year into 2022 when we start to make progress on that. That's the $900 billion. I'm also assuming that uh, we get one package, uh, $900 billion deficit finance, and that's that's it. You know, the Congress, will, the Senate will remain Republican. It'll be very difficult, if not impossible, for the Biden administration to get any other legislation through, certainly any deficit finance, fiscal, fiscal policy through. 
And, and if that's the case, then, you know, it's, it's, it's going to take a while to get the economy back to full swing a few years, but uh, we'll get there. If there is no, if I'm wrong and lawmakers can't get it together and, you know, we're watching what's going on today and President Trump just weighed in with his proposals and that kind of upended things a bit. So it's very possible we don't get anything. Uh, and if we don't, uh, then uh, 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 we're going to get into next, uh, January and things are going to feel a lot more un uh, uncomfortable, bigger job loss, uh, bigger increase in unemployment. And we'll start talking about double dip recession again. And we probably will have a double dip if they, the lawmakers can't pass anything on the other side of the inauguration. If they can't get anything done, no more relief, no more fiscal support, then I think a double dip feels like a likely scenario. Obviously, the second dip is not going to be anything like the first dip. I'm not arguing that, but it's going to be uh, long enough and, and down enough that you know we're going to feel it. Uh, people are going to know it. And what is this due to the, the federal deficit? I, mean, I know that's a, a very uh, important topic uh, also here at the state and local level here. New York uh, alone is talking about a $60 billion deficit for the next four years. The city, $14.5 billion. The MTA, $13 billion. Uh, with this kind of stimulus, I, I think to date we've had $2.5 trillion. Um, what does this do to the federal deficit? And are, are there things that we should be concerned about um, hyperinflation, how, how would you comment on, on the, the long-term effects of the stimulus? Yeah, I think deficits and debt are a problem. They're just not a problem right now. Uh, I mean, I, I think we need to get to the other side of the pandemic without going back into recession. Because if we do, if we go back into recession, then our deficits and, and debt problems will be even greater. You, you know, it's, it's, a, it's a Hobson's choice really for lawmakers. You know, there's no good choice. The, the, but the least bad choice is step up, provide another round of fiscal support, deficit finance, keep the economy together, not go back into recession, get to the other side, get back to full employment as fast as we can, because there's you know lots of obvious reasons why we can discuss. And then at that point, uh, you pivot and you start to address the long-term fiscal situation. That's going to require a lot of spending restraint, and it's going to require tax increases, to both, both of them, to do that. Kind of sort of an, analogous to what the Federal Reserve has told us they're going to do, right? They're going to keep uh, short-term rate rates pinned to the zero lower bound until we're back to full employment, uh, until inflation is above 2% target. And um, uh, they're going to keep that foot flat on the monetary accelerator until we get there. And so I would follow the same script on fiscal policy. Um, but, you know, having said that, all of that, you know, there is no free lunch, as economists are wont to say, there is a cost. And, you know, we're going to have uh, a struggle with our fiscal situation, not in, not in 2021, probably not in 2022, but you get into 2023, when 2024, when the economy is coming into full employment, inflationary pressures are developing, interest rates are starting to rise. I think, you know, that's when pressure to do something about our fiscal situation will be pretty intense. By, by the way, uh, I, I don't think we can address our fiscal situation, at least politically, get the will to do it unless interest rates do rise in a significant way, because it's impossible for lawmakers to connect the dots for the electorate between, you know, why are deficits and debt bad if, if it doesn't, you know, raise interest rates? And, you know, what's the problem? What are you guys so concerned about? You can, if that's the case, you can't generate the will. So you need those interest rates to start going up and financial pressure starting to develop and people really, investors really saying, I got to, I'm concerned I'm not going to get paid in a timely way. You got to pay me a higher interest rate to compensate for the risk. Then that'll generate the political will. But that's a 23 event, 24 event. That's not a 2020, uh, 2021 event. Uh, we, we just got to get to the other side of this pandemic as gracefully as we can. That makes a lot of sense. And I would imagine that the, the vaccine plays a huge part in that. And I, I think your report estimated that there'll be 25 million vaccines uh, delivered in the U.S. by mid-February. So, you know, with, with that in mind, there's a lot of talk. Is this a U-shaped recovery? Is this a V-shaped recovery? How, how do you see it? Yeah, I mean, obviously, I'm making an assumption about the inoculations. I mean, I'm we're assuming 25 million by uh, mid-February. We're assuming 100, 125 million by the end of 2021. And combined with, 
a like amount of people who've actually had the virus and thus have some some immunity, presumably, we're probably pretty close to herd immunity by this time next next year. And that's why I can you know feel a lot better about things. If we had this conversation a year from now, I think we're going to feel uh, a lot a, a lot better about how how things are going. But that you know that's obviously an assumption. And uh, in that case, you know, there's there's downside risk. Uh, you know, maybe things the vaccines don't work as well as we expect. You know, you saw the, uh, the news reports from the UK about uh, allergies for a couple of the folks that received the vaccine. So maybe things don't turn out, the vaccines aren't working quite as well as we hope, or adoption rates are a little lower than we hope. But there's also, you know, upside risk here too. I mean, you've got more vaccines coming uh, and um, maybe adoption's gonna turn out better than we anticipate and we can distribute this more effectively. So a, a lot of upside downside risk. Uh, around that particular assumption, but it's it's an important assumption, obviously. I mean, uh, to to determine when, you know, the coast is clear and when the economy will kick back into high gear. Because as soon as people feel like uh, they're safe, then I think there's there is going to be a lot of growth because, you know, high income households, high net worth households, you and I and everyone else on this call, you know, we've navigated this thing pretty well. We own stocks, we own our own home, enjoyed the run up in prices. We've held on to our jobs. We've got good health care. You know, this has been okay. And we've saved a lot of money because we haven't been traveling. We haven't been going to restaurants. We haven't been going to ball games and concerts and all the things we want to do. And we'll want to do them. Uh, and we'll want to do them all at once. So, you know, on the other side of this, when people feel like the coast is clear, I think we, we will get a, a lot of growth and, and get going. But having said all of that, uh, in terms of uh, jobs, employment, we can talk about other economic indicators like GDP or whatever you want to talk about. But in terms of jobs, which is kind of sort of what most people focus on, it, it, it's not a V. Uh, you know, we're down 10 million jobs from the pre-pandemic peak. We lost 22 million back in the recession. We've gotten 12 million back. We're down 10. I just argued that we might see some job loss in the next few months. It's going to take a few years to get those jobs back uh, under on, on almost any circumstance. The other thing to consider is of the 10 million jobs were down, I'm making this roughly up, but order of magnitude, 5 million are permanent, loss, gone. Another 4 million people have lost jobs at, and stepped out of the workforce altogether. Those are jobs that you know aren't coming back yet. Small business establishments in the retail sector, you know, gyms and restaurants, uh, you know, the, uh, uh, hotels, transportation distribution, you know, those things will ultimately get them back, but it's going to take a long time. So I don't think we get back the, those 10 million jobs for, in, in my baseline outlook, most likely outlook, I don't have that happening until late 2023. So three years from now. So it's gonna be, mm -hmm. this is not a V, this is, this is a slog. Yeah. And, and two follow-up questions to that on the job market. So um, talking first nationally, uh, be curious uh, what the division is between blue collar, white collar jobs and, and that statistic. And then when you look in the cities and we've got mostly a New York audience here, uh, I know the national unemployment right now you, you reference was uh, just above 6%, but in New York City, we're at 13% coming down yeah. from a peak of 20%. So uh, what's your outlook for uh, the return of the job market in cities as well? Slower. I think big cities like New York will be diminished by this. Um, you know, let me be clear. I think New York is a very vibrant, dynamic urban center, uh, global urban center. And it will be a highly successful economy. I'm not arguing that at all. All I'm arguing is that uh, it's not going to do as well as it would have done without the pandemic. And so, for example, to give you a sense of that, I wish I had a chart to show you. But you know, we do a lot of forecasting globally, U.S., national, but also metro areas. You know, we have a lot of folks in the real estate industry that use our uh, employment projections by industry, by occupation, down to the county level, you know, uh, to do their absorption forecast. So if you take a look at our uh, forecast for, um, say, overall total employment in the New York City metropolitan area, you know, pre-pandemic, it was good, you know, line, nice slope up, you know, headed north. And then the pandemic hit, big decline. We got a bit of a bounce, you know, uh, uh, when businesses reopened after the first hit, uh, things are slowing now. And then going forward, I, I have job jobs coming back, but in New York, we don't get all those jobs back 
until five or six years from now. Remember I said nationwide is gonna take three years. And then if you look at the slope of the line after that, it's less positive than it was before the pandemic. And that goes to uh, a number of forces, but work from anywhere, as I said earlier, in my view is a fundamental uh, development. It's not a one and done, we're going back to the way we were. And it's, it's going to, you know, you can see, I can see that, I can see that large corporations, I can see it at Moody's, right? I mean, uh, senior management, you know, including me, were very skeptical at working from home. They're very, very skeptical of the whole thing. Now, not so much. And if particularly if you live in New York and you're paying high taxes and high, uh, you know, high cost of living, and, you know, you're saying, you know, do I really want to be in New York if I can be in Tampa and do what I'm doing? You know, and by the way, I'm working harder than I ever did. So shouldn't I be able to do that? And, you know, uh, HR departments are trying to figure that one out. Like the one big question is, well, okay, if you go from New York to Tampa, should you still be paid New York wages uh, or Tampa wages? Uh, the, the, the answer is, not New York wages, but getting from here to there is, you know, a process. And so uh, that's going to slow things down. But I assure you that big companies are going to figure that that HR question out and a lot of other HR questions out. And I, I do think work from anywhere is real. And, and so uh, the converse of what I just described for that picture I just described for you for New York is go take a look at our forecast for employment in places like, uh, you know, North Carolina and South Carolina and Georgia Texas, uh, in the case of Californians, Californians streaming into Utah, Colorado. I mean, I, I, I've taken one trip since the pandemic. I flew out to Salt Lake City. I had the bright idea that I was going to go buy a home in Park City. I love Park City, right? And uh, I, I actually went, uh, took my two of my kids. Uh, we got on a plane. By the way, I felt perfectly fine on doing this. It was Delta, you know, very empty. The whole airports were empty. I, I you know, we were careful. First, I had my N95 max mask on, but by the end of it, I just had a simple mask on. I felt pretty, I felt safe. Uh, Park City's like, are you out? Of, it's crazy. And in fact, I even thought about buying a new home there. And I got the purchase agreement from the builder, who, by the way, I have no idea who this builder is. It seems to do good work. But the purchase agreement, I'll give it to you, James. You looked at it. You, you'd say to me, you, Mark, you'd be crazy to sign that thing. So I didn't sign it. It's just out of control. So, you know, there's going to be, again, a pendulum is going to swing back, but a very different picture. So I think, you know, uh, big cities, big global urbanized cities, they will do fine. I'm not arguing that, but they, when we look back 10, 20 years from now, you're going to, you're going to see, a, you're going to see the, you're going to see the imprint of that pandemic on, on employment, on income, on GDP, on everything. Uh, wow. So I, and, and I appreciate you sharing that story. And I, I think you're probably, uh, you know, smart, maybe not to, to pull the trigger. Uh, <laughs> in what you, what you I'm consider, bummed though. I'm bummed, you know, James. Kind of, I wanted well, that place, but you know, I, geez, you know. Well, I'm sure there's plenty of empty hotel rooms there now as well. But um, yeah, what, what, one of the questions uh, on the list was this boom in the suburban home market. And uh, it's interesting. I mean, we, we speak to our, um, offices across, uh, we have 60 offices across the U.S. And, and talking to some of our leasing brokers in the suburban markets, they're telling us that, yes, absolutely, we are placing uh, city offices, uh, opening up satellites, but they're small. First of all, these are five, 10,000 square foot leases, usually just for a couple execs, and they're short term in nature. We are not seeing a mass exodus uh, of large companies. I mean, you, you might say, well, James, what about Goldman Sachs that just announced leaving New York? And, and you know, cl clearly that there are some uh, exceptions. And uh, again, l l let me clarify, Go Goldman Sachs is not entirely picking up and leaving New York. It's just one, you know, what other divisions? But, um, yeah. you know, the point being is the suburban home market, there's no denying that that has certainly picked up both yeah. on the rental side and the sale so, side. So what, what is your uh, take on that? Do you think this is just a moment in time where you've got everyone moving out to the suburbs and once the jobs open back up in the city, they'll, they'll head right back? Do you think it's a mix of the two? How, how do you see well, that playing out? Yeah, I mean, there will be a swinging back of the pendulum, no doubt. I mean, you know, the, things have swung way over and, you know, people... Uh, we're in the middle of the pandemic. People uh, have felt fearful. They did want more space. 
so they have moved out. But once things normalize, we, you know, a year from now, uh, they're going to go back. You know, there's going to that sw- pendulum is going to swing back. I'm just arguing it's not going to swing all the way back, uh, and it's not going to swing back, you know, with the same uh, force that it has historically. So suburbs, exurbs, smaller cities and towns are going to uh, benefit from this longer run. And big urban areas are going to be diminished by that. And, you know, that has, we talked about the geographical implications, but it has real estate implications too. I mean, I do think single family wins relative to, to rental. Uh, you know, I think it does diminish office demand, uh, shifts the kind of office that will be demanded, uh, and it all, but also probably reduce absorption. There has been some conversation, reasonable conversation around, well, maybe you need more square footage per employee. Uh, I don't think so. Uh, in fact, just the opposite. I think you know people aren't going to be using spaces as much or as frequently, and you're going to be able businesses are going to be able to reduce the amount of space per per employee. Um, it has implications for retail, uh, obviously for the hotel industry. Uh, you know, the other obvious, in my mind, fundamental shift is business travel. Again, the pendulum will, will swing back when people can travel, but there there's no going back here. There's not. Uh, I mean, I just don't see uh, businesses, business people traveling to the same degree because what we're doing right now, we've got, we're getting really good at, and it has a lot of advantages. I mean, I, I have uh, 200, 250 economists that work for me around the globe, and I would spend energy, time, flying, and you know, they're Lon- New York, London, Prague, Dubai. I'm going in that direction. Uh, Singapore, Sydney, uh, Tokyo, Shanghai, I mean, Shanghai, Tokyo, uh, uh, Portland, uh, Orange County, California, Toronto, and here at home, Westchester, PA. I spent a boatload of time, you know, visiting those folks. And by the way, every one of those places was, the culture was a little different, you know, a little bit different. It wasn't a lot of communication, they would, you know, they didn't even create their own software, you know, to solve problems. Uh, now we get on a Zoom call and I got everyone on the planet on the same Zoom call. Not exactly right, because it got single, doing London and, and uh, or what is it, uh, doing Prague and uh, Singapore at the same time is not easy. Uh, but, you know, if, if you're sitting in the United States on the East Coast, but I got most of the, of the world on the same Zoom call and I can't tell you where they are, you know, right? there's no difference, no difference that we've completely broken down the, these cultural differences and it has significantly improved the integration of what we do uh, and, uh, and how we do it. And I, I, I would argue our productivity has been enhanced many, many times over. And so, uh, you know, I just don't see, I, and I, I know there are other anecdotes and cases where it hurts productivity. I'm, I'm sure there's the, ca- the cases of that, but I think net net, we're just not going to be traveling as much. And so obviously that has huge implications for uh, the accommodation industry, the travel industry, the, the, the uh, restaurants, recreation activities, that kind of thing. So uh, this, the, the, I think the pandemic has, will, uh, has resulted in some really fundamental shifts here that has tremendous implications for the real estate. The, the implications of the real estate industry are as big as for any other industry, except for perhaps healthcare and technology, you know, uh, massive change here. No question. No question. Uh, so I'd like to now shift to uh, the, the the presidency. And uh, I believe it was you or Moody's who issued a report saying that a Biden presidency will fuel our economy and job growth. So can you expand on that? Yeah, sure. That uh, I you can Google the paper. I, I think you say you could do Zandi macroeconomic consequences of Biden v. Trump and you get right to the paper. And we do this every four years, you know, we take the candidates proposals as they've laid them out and then just run a scenario. It's not a forecast. It's just a scenario. If the candidate gets exactly what he or she wants, there's no political fetters here, no constraints. What happens, uh, you know, to the economy? And we run that through. Uh, and uh, that was, you know, a little difficult to go around. It's always difficult, a little more difficult to go around because, uh, for Biden, he's got a lot of things out there, and there are uh, so a lot of new things, very hard to model. Uh, it, it, it's overload on transparency. I mean, it's like really transparent. 
which makes it difficult, you know, as a modeler. Uh, Trump, just the opposite, obviously, no transparency. I mean, you got to make a lot of guesses based on his previous budget because he has budgets. Yes, you know, he did have he did have a 2021 budget. That's his that and that we used. He had some things on speeches, and but that lack of transparency was a problem there. But we did the best we can, and we laid out the assumptions. And uh, Biden went wins hands down in terms of what it means for the economy over the next four years, in in large part because his policy prescription is to put the foot flat on the fiscal accelerator until we're back to full employment. Infrastructure being a big key part of that, education uh, being a key part of that. Uh, healthcare, uh, and then uh, sundry other things on ch- child care, uh, elder care, uh, housing, more housing uh, to support to address the affordable housing crisis. But it, it's a it's a it's a it's a boatload of spending uh, with ta- some tax increases to pay for part of it. You know, basically uh, taking the corporate tax rate from 21 percent effective rate back up to 28. And uh, the the big the big difference from the tax side is taxing uh, social security earnings above that cap, you know, the existing cap of, I think it's 140, $140,000 a year. Now he would tax anything above 400 K a year. But the net of all that is, is bigger deficits in debt, which in the current context is the right fiscal policy to generate growth and get back to the full employment as fast as possible, because you have very high unemployment, you have very high underemployment, you have very low inflation below the Fed's target. The Fed's all about raising inflation, getting above target. And most importantly, you have zero interest rates. So in that context, you want to put your foot on the accelerator, get back to full employment as fast as possible. And then if you do that, then you, because all of his, a lot of his spending is all front loaded, it goes away. And then you have, uh, then you focus on getting back, uh, uh, addressing the fiscal issues, the deficits and debt. And, and then spending goes way, way back in by 2024. You get those tax increases, uh, and uh, you land in a, in a much better place in the economy by the end of 2024, which is the end of the analysis. Uh, so that's the logic behind why his policy, if he got exactly what he wanted, would end the economy in a better place. Full. And when I say better place, what I mean by that is getting back to full employment faster is in a better place than under, under a Trump a, a policy. But you so, know, again, let me say, James, go look, you know, it's there, it's all the gory detail, all the assumptions. Uh, one, one big assumption I uh, made was, and, and, and this is an important one, is I did not consider regulatory policy. You know, you know what's gonna happen with fossil fuel regulation, climate change, uh, banking regulation, and you know, you could argue, uh, although it's hard to argue, and I haven't been able to connect the dots. But you know, you, intuitively, you can argue if you have less regulation, that means more growth. So you know, maybe. But I didn't. I, I to account for that would have been a bridge too far, at least for me. Yeah. It, it, and that answer is part of my next question. And, and I guess it's a sign that you've arrived when the Wall Street Journal uh, writes an op-ed uh, addressing one one of your reports. But they they, they did reference yeah, they, like they it. thought. Yeah. <laughs> thought, well, to, to put it politely, they, yeah. they said that you yeah. underestimated the impact of higher tax rates. And I think you just mentioned uh, the regulation piece. But um, yeah, and anything else you would you would have to say about the, the impact yeah, of the but, higher tax rates? Yeah, well, on regulation, I, I would defy anyone to uh, point to a, uh, a rigorous academic study, peer reviewed study anywhere that has been able to connect the dots in regulation and growth. I mean, the key thing, and I'm talking now to you as a business person, I started my own company and I sold it to Moody. So I, I've been a startup, me, a, a good size, small company. I had a hundred employees roughly, if I remember correctly, when I sold to Moody's and now I'm part of a multinational. So I, you know, am a business person as, as also as an economist and speaking to you as a business person and I have operations everywhere. So I know regulation from everywhere. Mm-hmm. I don't care what the regulation is. All I care about is you tell me what it is. If I got bright yellow lines, I can navigate around anything you throw at me. That's all I care about. I want certainty around the regulation. Uh, the regulations themselves, I mean, you know, sort of maybe, you know, but generally it's not a macro uh, economic event. On taxes, uh, the kind of tax rates we're talking about, you know, on corporations particularly, 
but also on high income individuals, they're, they're, the, the impact is negative, all else being equal on the economy. I'm not, I would not argue that it's positive. All else being equal, it's negative, but it's a very, very small negative. And by the way, I, I am not in, outside the mainstream here. You know, the mainstream uh, is the Congressional Budget Office, the CBO, the budgeter, nonpartisan, by, uh, nonpartisan organization. They are consensus. They go and they took a look at all the academic studies on all these things. They bring it together and they say, okay, what's kind of sort of in the middle of the distribution of all these studies? That's what we're going to use when we do the budget forecast for the United States. They did one on the Trump tax cuts. You can go take a look at their studies. They, they, they looked at the impact on growth. They even have tables with my growth expectations, Goldman Sachs's growth expectations, Penn Wharton Model X. Anyone who does this for a living, they brought it and put it in one table. And I tell you, it, we're all the same. It's a small, small negative impact. And just think about it for a second intuitively. And again, I'm speaking to you as a business person. The limit on, on growth isn't uh, cash flow. I mean, businesses are awash in cash flow, particularly big companies that take advantage of that low corporate tax rate, like, like a Moody's. You know, it, it just, it's just cash that we don't need the cash. We've got cash everywhere. So that's not a constraint on investment. And that's, that's the link between corporate tax rates and the economy is through investment. And the constraint on investment, I assure you, is not getting cash or credit. That is not a problem. Zero interest rates, 50 bips on 50 year money. I mean, it's not a problem. So that's not the constraint. So the intuition, what there's no even, no even, I can't even get my mind around what the intuition is for someone to argue that, you know, you lower the corporate tax rate, you're going to get this massive increase, this significant big increase in, in, in investment and in, in long-term economic growth. It just intuitively doesn't hang together uh, uh, for me as well. But I'm not arguing it's not negative. On the margin, it is. And, it, you know, it, it, it is a negative, but it's a very small negative. Perfect. Yeah. And we definitely appreciate your perspective, having been uh, an entrepreneur and a business owner yourself. Uh, so this might be a little bit too micro, but, but again, we, we have a real estate audience here and they are very focused on the Biden tax plan. I've been hearing a lot about the potential elimination of the 1031 exchange, which is a major driver of our business. Last year, we tracked that 50% of our sales involved um, 1031 on one, one side of the transaction. This allows investors to go buy bigger projects, create jobs, uh, it has been a real positive. Uh, also, the effect of raising the, the carried interest rates, so a lot of the private equity money that's out there investing in real estate. A anything else with the uh, its proposed tax plan on what you've heard that you think would, would have an impact, either positive or negative, on real estate? Yeah, first thing I'd say is, I, you know, I wouldn't be too worried about this. I mean, let's see what happens in Georgia, but, you know, under the most likely scenario, uh, we're going to have a divided government, and a divided government even small divided government, you know, with Senator McConnell leading the way in the Senate, I just don't envisage a major change in the tax code, uh, you know, in the Biden administration. Pretty tough to do. Uh, so, I mean, to some degree, this isn't, it feels academic, uh, you know, the, the conversation we're having around this. Uh, having said that, I, I do think uh, that, uh, to address our long-term fiscal situation. We will need spending restraint, and we can talk about what that should be, but we also need tax increases. Uh, the, the, the level of taxation in aggregate uh, across the economy is very low by any historical norm. So we are, uh, and that goes to the tax cuts that have been put in place, the Trump tax cuts, of course, and going all the way back to the Bush tax cuts uh, in the early 90s. So just take, just add up all tax revenue Fed, I'm talking about the federal level, state and local, not much different, and divide by whatever you want to divide by, GDP, profits, income. It's, it's lower today than it is on average since, let's say, 1960 over the past 50, 60 years. So we need to get that back, at least get that ratio of revenue, tax revenue to GDP back up to where it was on average, and probably a little bit higher because we got a, we got a deficit debt problem. And we also have to get spending down as a share of GDP. Uh, to get that down sufficiently so that we start addressing our, our long-term our long long -term fiscal issues. So if that's, your, if that's your frame, and then you're saying to yourself, okay, 
you know, how am I going to do that? What is the best way to generate that tax revenue? Meaning that something that's going to generate revenue, uh, something that's going to have less of an economic impact. And, and of course, when you change anything in the tax code, you create winners and losers. What can I do here that, you know, kind of uh, uh, ameliorates the winners and losers and, uh, you know, puts a little bit more pain on the people who, who can shoulder the burden a little bit more? Well, it's a, that's a judgment call, obviously, in a matter of political debate, but that should be part of the discussion, right? It's part of the conversation. So if you kind of think about that, then you say, okay, okay, I can see taking the corporate tax rate back up from 21 to 28. I'm not, I'm not saying going back to 35 because, you know, I do think there's, you know, the, the, there is some benefit to keep those corporate tax rates down in, from a global competitive uh, perspective. Uh, I can see taxing, uh, allowing the tax rate on um, upper income households to revert back to where they were pre-Trump. I, I could also see an argument for ta taxing uh uh, earnings above that 150 cap for high income households. I mean, you know, if you look at the percent of earnings that are taxed compared to where they were when Social Security was put on the planet, it's much, much lower because of the skewing of the income and wealth distribution. So I can see some arguments around that. And then if I re really need some more revenue, uh, I maybe in the real estate sector, but now we're on the margin, right? Because we're not going to generate a whole lot of revenue. Carried interest, you mentioned. I mean, I can't, I can't remember the scoring, but we're not talking 400 billion over 10. We're talking, I think we're talking 40 billion over 10. Uh, on the exchange, uh, do you know the, the amount of revenue you would raise if you eliminated that altogether? I'm, I'm not sure. I, I, you know, I think kind of on the margin, you know, in, in terms of the grand Yeah, it's, it's, it's not a big number, actually. Yeah, it's not a big number. Relatively speaking, yeah. Yeah, so, I mean, then if you're sitting there as a policymaker in the trenches trying to craft a tax bill and, and you're going to use political capital for something, would you really use it for that? Right. I, I'm not really right. sure. And then you don't and it's know. Not just the, it, yeah, I was, was going to say, say, it's not just the real the estate. Yeah. Consequences of it, right? I mean, mm -hmm. it could be highly disruptive. Do you really want to do that? I mean, because you don't really know. And if you really want to do something that's potentially disruptive, and it's going to generate revenue. Maybe you try financial transactions tax, you know, something like that. Uh, mm. you know, go, go somewhere like that. So I'm not, I'm not overly worried about those things. Uh, you know, I, I wouldn't worry about it at this point. It feels more academic mm -hmm. to me. Perfect. So um, we are happy to take questions from the group as well. I've got a couple more questions myself and then I'll open it up. But um, a question did come through in the chat from uh, Dennis Sherry from our office. And he, he asked about government uh, spending as it relates to entitlement programs. And um, so I don't know if you have any thoughts on that as, as a way to uh, get the economy going on as well. Yeah, I mean, the key entitlement programs are Medicare and Medicaid, right? I mean, Social Security, that's uh, not a big deal in terms of what it means long term. Uh, and, and there, I, I think I would fully fund Social Security at the current level of benefits, uh, just because you've got, you know, some very hard pressed low income households that rely on Social Security. Uh, and, and you can easily, if you, you know, narrowly focused on that payroll tax increase, uh, for upper uh, uh, on earnings of above 400k, if you put that into place, you've paid for Social Security by itself. So let's just put that aside. I think I'd leave that alone. On Medicare and Medicaid, that goes to healthcare costs. So it's really about focusing on, you know, the cost of healthcare. And and there, I think we need to take another crack at healthcare reform and make sure that, you know, we do that right in the context of what we've learned for, uh, with the ACA and in place now for coming up on a decade. So we've got enough data points to really, I think, get a better sense of what, what's been working, what's not been working when it comes to containing the cost of healthcare and providing good quality healthcare to a broad set to, to, to our entire population. So I think that's where the money is uh, and where we should be focused. But I do think we need to, uh, entitlements, meaning Medicare and Medicaid should be, uh, you know, uh, we should be focused on, on that like a laser beam because that's, that's where the money is and that's where if we're going to address our long-term fiscal problems, that's what, that's what we're going to have to address. No doubt. Uh, so now I'd like to talk about uh, what a Biden presidency will mean uh, for the, the blue states and especially New York. So I, I believe this current stimulus, I, I think there was $180 billion carved out for the, the, the states, which again, that doesn't, I mean, I just said that the New York state's deficit alone, I think is $60 billion over the next um four years, but but how do you see that? I mean, I, I would assume 
uh, a net positive with the Biden presidency to states and, and certainly cities like New York? Yeah, I don't know that I made a distinction between blue and red. I mean, actually, there was a great piece in the New York Times uh, earlier in the week or late last week that, you, that used a, a lot of our the work that one of our guys does, Dick guy, guys does on state and local government in estimating budget shortfalls. And the point of the article, and I think it's right, is the budget shortfalls are uh, as a share, as a percentage of total revenue or the state's GDP or you know, scaling it to the size of the state is are bigger in red states than they are in blue states. You know, I'm painting with a broad brush. Uh, New York has obviously been completely hammered by the pandemic and has suffered uh, you know, as much as anyone from uh, the pandemic, at least to date, this is still a script being written. But other states, every other state is suffering budget shortfalls and red states uh, have been particularly hard hit, particularly states in the energy uh, uh, country, right? Because the collapse in oil prices and other commodity prices really is because they rely very heavily on severance taxes and other forms of uh, taxation on the energy sector. And uh, they've been, uh, been hammered. So this is not a red blue thing. This is a, a nationwide thing. Uh, and I think it's very important to provide support to state and local governments because, and it's tried and true because st support because in every recession, because as you know, state and local governments have restrictions on their ability to go uh, uh, deficit finance uh, their activities uh, constitutionally. So they re rely on the federal government to step in and provide help when times are tough, like the current time. And, if, and it, every recession that's been the case, and it's worked very, very well, there's a lot of academic research that shows how important that is and how effective that is in supporting economies. And, and there it's very intuitive, right? I mean, if state and local governments can't get money, then they have to cut people. And think about the people they're cutting, teachers, fire, police, emergency responders, healthcare workers, you know, people you need at any time, but particularly in a crisis like a healthcare crisis. Then they, then they go and cut programs, you know, for housing and food assistance and, you know, things that low income people that are, you know, on the fringes really desperately need. And then they cut services, you know, things that everyone uses, you know, police and fire and, and, and trash collection and, you know, well, the, the gazillion things that people don't even realize state local governments provide until you actually need them. Uh, they're, th they're there for you. Uh, so that it doesn't make a whole lot of sense. So you would think you would really want to ante up and help. And particularly given that this is ecumenical across blue and red, there's, there's no, no difference here. 180 billion, you know, if you asked me six months ago how much I probably double that, you know, 180 billion you know, feels on the soft side to me, but, you know, they might be able to, state and local governments might be able to get through, uh, get through with it, given they haven't, you know, navigated through this pandemic a little better than, a, I say meaningfully better than I, I, I think anyone thought, including myself six months ago. So 180 billion, if I were king for the, if, if I were in Congress, I'd sign on the dotted line. I'd I want more. I think it makes good policy to provide more, but I wouldn't stop me from signing because at this point, speed is much more important than size. Perfect. That's great perspective and appreciate your sharing that. So I, I have one last question. And then we, we've got uh, the, the question and the answer box is filling up. So I'll, I'll get to that next. But uh, we've got a lot of real estate investors on the line and wondering where the opportunities are. And if, I'll just throw out some quick stats on what we've tracked uh, yeah. for um pricing based on asset class. And this is just New York City. And we look at just second and third quarter transactions. They're definitely post COVID and we compare them to their pricing in 2019. But land sales have been hit the hardest values down 30%. Multifamily was immediately impacted with a 29% decline in pricing. Office and retail at a 24% decline. A lot of people think there's definitely more room to go there, depending on you know if these tenants come back. Um, there's not enough trades for us to give uh, a statistic on industrial and medical uh, in New York City, uh, but if I had to guess, I'd probably say those values have increased by 20 or 30 percent. So um, do those statistics, you know, make sense to you when you look at it through a national lens? And if you were uh, advising investors right now, uh, what asset classes to be thinking about, where to be thinking about, uh, what would you say to that? Yeah, they, that sounds, I mean, for New York, it sounds about right. I mean, nationwide, obviously, things have held up much better. Um, uh, you know, we are at Moody's projecting uh, national uh, price declines across uh, 
most of those asset class you, you mentioned, you didn't mention hotels, uh, that also would be down, you know, very significantly nationally. Uh, although it's going to take a while for that to show up uh, in the data. Uh, first of all, you know, it, it, you know this better than I, but when you have a, 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 some kind of shock to a market, it takes a while for buyers and sellers to kind of figure out, well, what's true value? So transactions go away. And so you can't, you don't have transparency. So you don't have a price. There's a shadow price, as they say, but no actual price. And then ultimately transactions, people figure it out, transactions occur, and then it takes a while to get that into the data. So my guess is, you know, we won't have a real good sense of this for a year or two, maybe even three, you know, how much damage has been done on the commercial real estate side. Uh, the, other, the other thing I'll throw into the mix on, price, on prices and valuations, which matters a lot for places like New York and other urban centers is, is, is global demand, right? I mean, very significant investor demand from overseas. And, uh, you know, I think uh, obviously that's been under a lot of pressure as well as because global investors, they're one step removed from the markets than you and I are and are more uncertain and don't really know what value is. And so they're even more reticent. The value of the dollar is very strong, you know, vis-a-vis -vis other currencies. So that, you know, makes things a little bit more difficult unless that do dollar continues to come down. So that also has played a role in depressing, you know, like New York City versus, you know, other parts of the country. But I would say, I would expect, you know, price weakness over the next couple of years as we work through all these dynamics, we, particularly in hotels, followed by brick and mortar retail. You know, I'm not saying anything people don't know, uh, you know, followed by um, uh, multifamily and, and, and then ultimately office. And industrial, that, you know, obviously positive because of the uh, online uh, dynamic that's shifting stuff from being on store shelves to being in warehouses. So, you know, it helps absorption there. So I don't, you know, I don't yeah. think anything I've said is, is kind of, you know, it's pretty much getting baked in, I think, pretty quickly in, in, in the mm -hmm. pricing. I, I do think, you know, urban areas, as I've been arguing, diminish relative to ex suburban, ex -urb, small cities and towns. Uh, I'm trying to think of, of anything that I would, you know, I, it, one, one asset class that a little eso, more esoteric that I think has a lot of room uh, is single family rental. So you got a lot of folks that want single family, but, you know, don't have the income to, or now with house prices rising, and as soon as mortgage rates start to rise again, affordability is going to become a real issue. And so single family rental might become, you know, an even more attractive asset class, small in the grand scheme of things, but, you know, some parts of the country, it's like if you go down in Florida or Texas or Arizona, it's a big deal. Uh, and so that, that might matter. But uh, other than that, I don't have a, a, any more, uh, a lot of insight on, on that question. Yeah. No, that, that all makes a, a lot of sense and is consistent with what we're seeing. And th there haven't been enough hotel trades for us to, to come up with a, um, a pricing decline. But I, I read in a report today that unfortunately 50% of New York City hotels are in special servicing right now. So uh, which, which shouldn't be a, uh, a surprise. But yeah. And, 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 I was just going to say, you can see it in CNBS delinquency rates. You know, Moody's collects yes. the delinquency rates. On, you can see it, you know. Yes. All right, I'm going to open it up to some questions for our audience. We have to start with Hugh Kelly, who was kind enough to make the introduction. Hugh, thank you uh, always, and you always have incredible insight into the market as well. But he would like you, Mark, to make some comments about a national infrastructure program for both the perspective of economic efficiency and as a jobs generator across occupations. Yeah, good policy. Thanks, Hugh. Uh, good to uh, hear your voice mentioned. Uh, you're a good friend. I appreciate it. Um, uh, yeah, I mean, at, at the top of my uh, policy list of things to do if I were king and uh, I'd be able to get a piece of legislation through would be a large infrastructure plan. I mean, that uh, helps with a lot of problems. It, you know, I mentioned those 5 million people who've lost their jobs permanently. You know, I think many of those folks could work in on infrastructure related projects. It takes some skill, some education and training, but I think you know, that would be a, a natural place for them to go for, for a job. Infrastructure is everywhere. Uh, we need infrastructure everywhere. So it's, you know, it's a jobs program, not only for New York City, but, you know, the suburbs of the city, the exurbs, the rural areas. And, you know, we have a, we have a problem, an employment, unemployment problem from coast to coast, every community, and it would be helpful in doing that. And then obviously, long run, 
uh, infrastructure is key to the economy's long-term productivity growth. It makes businesses more productive. I mean, if people have to sit in traffic getting to work, uh, it reduces everyone's productivity. If they you know, have poor internet speeds, that reduces everyone's productivity. If kids don't have access uh, to online schooling, that reduces productivity. You know, I, per, you know, I, it, I, you know, coming on the Acela into New York and getting stuck in the New York tunnel, that, you know, come on, hand me a break, you know, so come on, you know, you know that's just nuts. Uh, so housing, you've got a, a massive affordable housing problem for low income households, kills productivity because these workers have to live way out, commute, come in for where the jobs are. Uh, it, you know, they can't do it in many cases, right? Because they have childcare, they have commute costs, and they, it's just not economical for them to do it. So it, that feels like a slam dunk to me. I mean, I, I, could, I could take a, a dart, throw it at a, a map of the United States, and within two miles of that uh, circumference, of the radius of that dart, I can find a project with a return, an infrastructure project with a return that's higher than zero. I can assure you I can do that. So go borrow money at zero, or let's say, you know, say, okay, 100 basis points, you know, 10 year treasury yield, go borrow 100 bips. I assure you, you can find projects that have IRRs that are 10 times that. So why aren't we doing that exactly? You know, uh, so uh, yeah, uh, number one on, on the top of the list. And make it big, please, you know? I like the sound of that. Well, we only have uh, time for one more question, but it, it's kind of along these lines uh, to your last point. And uh, Chris Molling from our LA office uh, wants to know how long these uh, interest rates are gonna be sticking around for. And, and I will say that, that that has made the buying opportunities today unprecedented. Uh, one of the things that I wrote about uh, my December white paper uh, that you all can find at aytristateinvestmentsales.com was called Buy New York City Now and talking about how our pricing, not only is it below where we were last year, but we're at 10-year lows. Uh, but 10 years ago, uh, the 10-year treasury was over 200 basis points higher. So if you look at where you can borrow money today and looking at the power of that cash on cash return, um, th these returns are truly unprecedented. So with that in mind, Mark, how long are we going to be enjoying this, you know, close to zero uh, interest rate environment? Yeah, it sounds like a great piece. I mean, can you send me the link? I'd love to. If Absolutely. I'm able to get access. I'd love to read it. Uh, well, I think the Federal Reserve is going to manage interest rates, both short and long, uh, until the other side of the pandemic, until, you know, we're really on the other side of the pandemic. So maybe a year from now. So that means zero short term rates. That means I don't think we get long rates, 10 year yields much above 1%, you know, until at least mid 2021. I think they're also effectively targeting fixed mortgage rates. So, you know, the, you know, the fixed mortgage rates below three record low. I don't think they want to see it above three during the pandemic. Uh, so I think we can count on very, very low rates for the next six, you know, where they are now for the next six to nine months. And then on the other side of the pandemic, then I think they allow long rates to start to adjust, uh, you know, with market forces so that they'll, they'll start to migrate higher. Uh, that, then, by the way, they'll keep short rates, as I said earlier, pinned to the zero lower bound until we're back to full employment, which I argued early, earlier is three years from now. So that means the yield curve is going to get a lot more positively sloped here over the next three years. Uh, I will end this way. I'm a little controversial, and this goes to, to some of my uh, nervousness around CRE and pricing. Uh, I, I suspect, you know, I'll, I'll catch it this way. The biggest surprise to me as a macroeconomist on, these, on the other side of the financial crisis during that long expansion was how low inflation and interest rates were. Uh, I think the biggest surprise on the other side of the pandemic may actually be how high inflation and interest rates are. So I'll just leave you with that. Well, I, I love it, that. And that's a great way to end with some, some food for thought. And Mark, we'll, we'll definitely have to welcome you back. Uh, you know, six months, a year from now, we'll, we'll, we'll see how this all plays out. But I know we're all hoping for the best in 2021 and just can't thank you enough for your insight and wisdom with everything going on. You, you certainly are a clear voice and, and we, we can't thank you enough. Well, James, I want to thank you. And I just want to warn everyone, I, my goal is to be 51% right. So just, just say. <laughs> You're just like say. the casinos. <laughs> yeah, there Very you good. go. <laughs> Wonderful. Thank you, everyone, for joining. We look forward to being in touch. Yeah.
Bye-bye.